July 20, 1895, The Daily Star, Fredericksburg, Virginia, a Chicago sensation, the charred bones of Minnie Williams found in a stove, Chicago, July 20. Another appalling crime will be laid at the door of H. H. Holmes, the notorious insurance swindler and the alleged murderer of the Pitazels. That Minnie Williams of Fort Worth, Texas, met her death at the hands of Holmes, there is scarcely a doubt. That she died in this city in a violent manner has been proven almost conclusively. Late last night, the police found in a stove, in the three-story brick building at 63rd Street, which was built by Holmes, and in which both he and the Williams girl lived, a quantity of charred bones, buttons known to have been on a dress owned by Minnie Williams, and a partly melted portion of a watch chain, which was positively identified as having been the property of the girl. All of the ashes and debris removed from the stove were carefully preserved and taken to the police station where a more careful examination will be made of them. The police are now of the opinion that not only Minnie Williams, but her younger sister Anna and the boy Howard Pitazel met death in this house. This morning at six o'clock, they started to renew the search of the house, beginning with the basement, which is being dug up. They are of the opinion that they will find either the body of Anna Williams or that of Howard Pitazel before they have concluded their work. April 13, 1896, Aurora Daily Express, Aurora, Illinois. Holmes victims, some of them whose names are in his confession. Part of the record at Chicago. Method of the removal in a few of the most notable cases. His start in life as a body snatcher. Chicago Castle built to aid and hide crime. Infamous doings of a devil-begotten product of a boasting century. Philadelphia, April 13. The revelation of infernalism which H. H. Holmes makes in his confession, involves the murder, among others at Chicago, of the following. Julia Connors, a woman who had been divorced from her husband and entered the employ of Holmes at his castle, 63rd and Wallace Streets. Pearl Connors, the six-year-old child of Julia Connors, skeleton found in the basement of the castle by the police. Minnie Williams, his mistress, who had come to Chicago from Fort Worth, Texas, and lived with him at the castle and in various parts of the city. Nanny Williams, sister of Minnie Williams. Emily Sigrand, employed by Holmes as a typewriter, home in Lafayette, Indiana. Some of these persons were asphyxiated, others poisoned. Subsequently, they were dissected by Holmes their skeletons incinerated so far as possible, and the remains buried in the basement of the castle. Some more of his victims named. In addition to these, he murdered in Toronto Annie and Nellie Pittisel, children of Benjamin Pittisel, and in Indianapolis, Howard Pittisel. In this city, he killed Pittisel himself. He had made arrangements for the killing of Mrs. Pitazel and her eldest daughter, Desi, but his arrest for the murder prevented him. It is believed that he had also planned for the killing of Patrick Quinlan and his wife, employees of his in Chicago, May Yoke, his last wife, and the Mrs. Holmes, his second wife, now living at Wilmette, Illinois. These comprise the six contemplated murders to which he makes gruesome reference. Deserts his first wife and child. Of German descent with the German love for the sciences, the study of the mysterious, 
Holmes tells of his early life with pious parents in a New England home. While still a young man, he marries a young girl of his native town, by whom he has a son. This son lives and is the first victim selected by Holmes. He mutilates him in a terrible manner, but the hunger for blood being satisfied by the act does not kill him. Holmes deserts the wife and child and goes to Ann Arbor to begin the study of medicine. He proves to be a hard student. He takes up special branches, the study of poisons and their effects, of gases and their properties. He is poor. He has a love for luxury, a passion for women. The carnal controls him. Body Snatching as a Profession To get wealth, he resorts to body snatching from Michigan graveyards. He also practices swindles on insurance companies by acquiring bogus bodies, passing them off as those of parties whom he has had insured, and collecting the insurance. In this way, he accumulates about $15,000. He decides to make Chicago his home, the center of his operations. Representing himself to be a poor man, he becomes the clerk of a druggist at 63rd and Wallace Streets. In a few months, he owns the place. He has studied law, especially the tricks which a dishonest man may practice with it. He becomes interested in a letterpress copier, which he calls the ABC. The clay for the manufacture of this copy he secures in England. He begins the erection of his castle. The plans of the building are his own. Plans for a life of crime. He wishes to have an interior in which he may become secure from all public notice. He designs labyrinths, trapdoors, secret ways, false vaults, and a laboratory. So unique is his plan that for days, when he is supposed to be out of the city, he may be safely within the building. Even the woman who serves as his landlady does not know that he is at home, until by chance she finds him walking in one of the many halls. He can leave or enter the building by a half dozen ways. He uses disguises, makeups, which totally change his appearance. His one chief object in life, to destroy body and soul, if possible, all his associates. All this time, the one central thought in his mind is that the end of all this scheming and plotting is to be murder. He writes, where others' hearts were touched with pity, mind filled with cruelty, and where in others the feeling was to save life, I reveled in the thought of destroying. Julia Connors works for him. She has been a victim of his lust. She comes to his office on a morning and is entrapped in his false vault, airtight. The walls of this vault are deadened with chemical wool. The body remains there. In time, Holmes removes it. He has a huge stove in the office, vats and furnaces in the basement. By fire and chemical processes, he destroys the body. Later, the child Pearl is killed. The chamber in which there were no windows, into which gas could be introduced, to which Holmes could come by secret ways while his victim slept, was where the child met her end. So, too, did other victims, their blood staining the floor, the door panels, the steps of the secret trap down which they were dragged to the basement. Nanny Williams is killed because Minnie Williams has become jealous of Holmes' attentions to her. In time, Minnie goes also, and the girl, Emily Sigrund. To account for the former's disappearance, Holmes gets up a story of her having been married and gone abroad. He even has the wedding cards printed and sent to her friends. Financial difficulties and a fire inspired by him cause him to lose the castle. The property at Fort Worth, of which he has robbed the Williams sisters, is causing him trouble. Pitazol has become an active partner with him in various disreputable schemes. 
Pedizol is an inventor and a drunkard. He comes completely under the influence of Holmes. The authorities are beginning to investigate the men. They go to Texas, then to St. Louis, and plan to rob the Fidelity Insurance Company of Philadelphia. Pedizol is insured for $10,000 in the company. Holmes brings him to the city, where he is established in business. One day, he is found dead in his room. The body has been mutilated and burned. Holmes claims the insurance as a friend of the family and collects it. He takes Mrs. Pitizel and her five children over the country on a wild goose chase. On the pretense that he will educate three of them, he separates them from their mother. Later, the bodies of the two girls are found buried in the basement of a house in Toronto. Holmes had lived in the house with them. The body of Howard, the boy, is found in a basement in Indianapolis. Holmes had lived there also. The bodies of all three children had been mutilated and burned. The police of Chicago, Detective Goyer of Philadelphia, and the residents of Inglewood, who knew Holmes well when he lived at the castle, have never had a doubt of his having committed these murders. There has been a general opinion that he had accomplices in several of the murders. Pitizel is believed to have known something of the death of Emily Segrand, and two parties now living are suspected of having been parties to the death of the Williams girls. I was born with the devil in me, says Holmes. No one who watched the Chicago police exposing the mysteries of his castle will contradict the statement. April 12, 1894, Lewiston Daily Sun, Lewiston, Maine. Winding up of fair. Some features of exposition that produce sentiments of sadness. It is a singular fact that a large majority of strangers who go to Chicago, either on business or for pleasure, take advantage of the opportunity to visit the desolated grounds of the World's Fair. The railroad trains and the streetcars passing by, or terminating there, have enjoyed a large traffic from this source ever since the exposition closed. Thousands of people have gone there and tramped around in the snow, looking at the desolate and dismantled buildings and experiencing a certain kind of sad pleasure in the oppressive silence that is broken only by the dashing of the waves of Lake Michigan upon the sandy beach. Many of the beautiful and splendid buildings have been destroyed by fire or wrecked by the elements. Others have been dismantled by workmen. The busy streets, which echoed to the tramp of happy millions, are as silent as the grave. People will talk about the World's Fair and the Midway Pleasance for 20, 30, and even 50 years. Remember how the older people still talk of the wonders they saw nearly 20 years ago at the Centennial Exposition. That was not a circumstance to the World's Fair. The further we get away from the fair, the more wonderful it will appear. Hence, how important it is that you preserve it in permanent form as it is reproduced in The Magic City. The sun now has 16 numbers and will take pleasure in supplying you with all the back numbers if you have neglected to get them as they were published. We give them away to our readers for only 10 cents for each number. The publisher's price is 25 cents per copy. Get them now while you can, for the series will soon be exhausted. <laughs>